Hey there. Okay, so we are going to start talking. Um, we're going to jump into module six. So it's kind of like the wrap, wrap up last module uh, for this mini lecture series. And um, what we're going to talk about today are some common pitfalls in seismic interpretation. Just the common ones. There are so many of them out there. Okay, so there are, um, here's a list that I, that I put together. Um, it's somewhat comprehensive, um, but I'm going to go through all of these kind of one by one for at least a slide each. Um, but some of the things we want to be concerned about have to do with the fundamentals of seismic data that I've been talking about um, for, you know, the last two dozen, three dozen videos or so. Um, those are things like not being certain of your polarity and your phase, um, different uh, differences in seismic acquisition and processing, and just not being aware of what happened during the those. Um, not understanding your sand shale uh, depth trend if you're dealing with classics. You've got seismic resolution, seismic detection, interference, tuning effects. We've talked about velocity push down and velocity pull up uh, depending on uh, velocity heterogeneities in your geology. Um, there's some pitfalls that go around auto picking, that go around bright spots. Um, interpreting multiples in your data, uh, fault shadows, lithologies, you know, fizz gas, carbonates versus volcanics. So I'm going to try to spend 15 or 20 minutes or so and go through a bunch of them just to kind of like raise awareness of kind of those questions you should be asking yourself. Okay, so the first one has to do with do you know your data polarity and do you know your wavelet phase? <laughs> okay, so just fundamentals. Um, and so here's a great example from the, the Brown textbook where we're looking at two different things. Okay, so we've got two different events. In one, we have, um, I don't know exactly what the colors mean, but we've got opposite, opposite kind of peak trough, trough peak, let's say. And so, yeah, we can line all these up with the vertical well, but do we have any idea which one might be hydrocarbon related? Um, and if we don't understand our, our phase and our polarity and what our color scale means, we're not going to be able to be like, okay, yeah, the hydrocarbons are in the top sand or the top feature versus the bottom feature. And so just knowing phase polarity are really essential. Seismic acquisition and processing issues. So we've talked about, um, you know, how we can have things like spectral whitening being applied. And I talk about that example that I, that I dealt with earlier in my career. Um, here we've got an area where we've got uh, high amplitudes and then they kind of dim out. Um, and so one of the things they notice here is that the high amplitudes dim out. And so this is kind of like where they, you know, are prospecting. Um, but if there's anything on the surface that's kind of diminishing, so maybe we don't have the same fold data um, in terms of acqui acquisition, uh, maybe we had to work our way around something, maybe we're near the edge of the survey. If we don't understand that, we don't really understand why things are dimming. Okay, so this, this reflection here could actually be um, a strong reflection throughout and just be one of those sand or shale or you know, whatever beds, uh, lithologic beds that always have a bright amplitude. Okay. And so that dimming may not be due to being in the water lake as compared to the fluid lake. Um, it's always important to know your sand shale relationship with depth if you're working in clastics, um, because you need to know in terms of impedance, are your sands, um, do they have a higher acoustic impedance relative to your shales? or a lower uh, acoustic impedance relative to your shales. Um, and that will all kind of tie in also to what AVO effect you may need. So it's good to know where on this trend curve you, you lie, and that helps you uh, figure out what you should be looking for in terms of bright spots, dim spots deeper, or polarity uh, reversals. Seismic resolution is also important to know. Um, and we, we've talked about this throughout the course and in a lot of examples. And also one of the things I want to mention is tuning effects. And just remind you of this because we talked about it a little bit, but those tuning effects are where you have the constructive and destructive interference from the top and the bottom layer of the side lobes. And so that can cause a anomalous um, seismic amplitude that can cause you to get very excited that perhaps it's due to hydrocarbons, but really it's just due to, to thin bed tuning. Velocity 
Pull up and push down are also things that can create artificial structures um, in seismic. And so this is an example, I've shown you some other ones, um, but with, with salt diapirs, they have uh, higher velocities than the clastics around it in this example. And so you get this artificial pull up when you're working in the time domain. Um, and so that can create artificial structures underneath it. Same thing will happen for volcanics, for carbonates. If you have a gas cloud um, that has a, a lower velocity, then you'll get an artificial push down. But these pull-ups um, are kind of more of what often cause us to uh, notice structural traps uh, for hydrocarbons that, that aren't actually there. Um, in this case, we've got something similar to what I was talking about, um, but we've got a gas cloud up a little bit higher that is actually causing a false uh, rollover. So right here. Um, so it makes it look like it's, it's more of a rollover structure because right below the gas cloud, it's kind of pushing it down. And so you're getting more of that rollover. Um, and you can kind of see that here when we're looking at um, the depth migrated data in time right here versus the depth migrated data in depth. And you can, you can really see it in both these blue and then this kind of like dotted circle. Another thing to be aware of is when you have non-flat flat spots, again, also from shallow gas. And so here you can have that gas cloud that artificially pushes things down. It kind of changes the velocity. And so you're having a non-flat flat spot. You shouldn't just dis disavow it, <laughs> but you should look into it more and see if, if you can understand it. And again, that's the whole thing of like working in time versus working in depth is that hopefully you've been able to account for some of these velocity heterogeneities. You can also have pitfalls in auto picking. Um, and so this is one case where if you're not really paying attention um, and auto picking, you could start, you know, like here we've got our red line. Um, and this is from one of Don Heron's um, papers just talking about it. You know, you're picking, you've got a nice clear reflection and then, you know, any, in any case, when you're auto picking, if things get really noisy, you can also often jump correlate and, or not jump correlate, jump miscorrelate. <laughs> so that correlation will jump down or it may jump up. Whereas you as the geologic interpreter, you know, need to understand, you know, like you can understand noise and you can understand poor imaging. And so, you know, especially based on some of these reflections that are a little bit clearer up here, um, you would actually go in and pick this green line, you know, to probably go up to the base of salt. Um, another thing that can happen is, you know, just being aware that there are a lot of features in the subsurface that you can't auto pick, that you can't snap to a certain horizon. And so this is just one example with a, a channel where we've got erosion. And so we're able to pick, um, you know, I, I, I can't remember if this is like the top of salt right here. That's easy to pick. We've got a nice strong reflection, even this feature right here. So this horizon's easy to pick, but we need to be able to go in and recognize, okay, well now we're hitting an erosional surface with this channel. And so we wouldn't expect that um, yellow horizon up here to continue to be picked throughout, which the software might, will try to do it for us. And so there's quite a few pitfalls in auto picking, which is why I tend to do it very slowly <laughs> and methodically when I auto pick. Um, you know, it's a lot of understanding the data and the limitations, like optimizing your auto picking parameters, um, testing it out, and then extensively QCing. Um, that's really important. <laughs> Okay, so there's a lot of pitfalls with bright spots. Um, so some of the common false bright spots that we come across are things with those higher velocities, uh, maybe more of the more unusual lithologies from volcanic intrusions, um, highly cemented sands. So if you have like a calcite cement, you could have overpressure sands or shales, uh, coal beds actually work in the opposite way, and then uh, tops of salts. So you want to be aware of those unusual, uh, unusual lithologies that may be lurking in your area. <laughs> um, there's also a lot of pitfalls with flat spots. So we talked about some of these in the DHI lecture, um, but you could have diagenic events 
that cause a pseudo flat spot. Um, there's cases where clinoforms can appear flat. Volcanic sills often get in, um, de kind of deposited, I guess they're not really deposited, uh, intruded <laughs> in flat manners. You could have all sorts of paleo contacts. Um, uh, sheet flood deposits, so those fans can often look uh, flat. Um, yeah, the base of, of fan lobes and channels, ocean bottom multiples. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done. Like if you notice a flat spot or something that's cross cutting, you know, and even think about 2D versus 3D data where you could have some of that ghosting of other features into your 3D. Um, here's an example um, from one of Bill Abriel's SCG interpretations compilations, which I thought was kind of fun. Um, so here we've got salt. We're working in the Gulf of Mexico, and we can see the top of salt and then the base of salt. And so, um, you know, kind of picking in that area, here he's kind of showing how he's gone along and he's picked this red horizon. And so we've got this nice kind of structural dome right here. Um, but actually what he ended up picking was part of the reflection of the top of salt and the, you know we could also see the reflection of the base of salt. And so I throw this in here because not all multiples are due to the ocean bottom, but they can be due to any strong reflector. And in this case it's it's top and base of salt. You can also get fault shadows. Um, and this is a case, it's kind of easy to, to picture. Uh, the idea a little bit better in a cartoon where you've got a fault and then on either side of that fault you have very different rocks perhaps with very well with very different velocities so if you've got that big velocity variation laterally you can end up with kind of these uh, these fault shadows from having um, those different velocities very very close to each other um, we see it happen vertically and it also happens laterally and so this is an example of an area where we've got uh, a fault with very strong velocity contrast on either side of it. Um, when we look at the data in time, okay, we've got um, our 72 well, which was gas bearing, super exciting. Um, and the original plan was to drill up dip of it. Okay, so kind of capture those remaining reserves that we weren't able to get before. Um, but when they look at, and you know, when they recognize, well, there's a, a, a fault nearby, like let's migrate this, uh, reconvert this time data into depth data. What they actually noticed is that <laughs> the, the structure wasn't dipping up, it was dipping down in that area. So if they had drilled that original plan, they would have been drilling down dip and it would have been a failure of uh, economic failure. <laughs> and so instead, once they did depth, um, uh, converted it to depth, they were able to better pick a new location. And so that's that 99 um, actual location shown here, which ended up being a nice productive gas well. Um, other things to consider, and I showed you examples of these in a, in a previous lecture, is the idea of fizz gas, undersaturated gas, um, uneconomic gas reserves, whatever you want to call it, they wouldn't be reserves. Um, but to keep in mind that if you have 10% gas in a brine, it will look the same in terms of amplitudes as 100% gas. Um, so those are some ambiguities that you kind of have to work with. Uh, you can often have cases where sands and shales are indistinguishable from each other because they have similar acoustic impedances. And so that goes back to that depth trend that um, I said you always want to make sure that you know where you're working. <laughs> and then other things to keep in mind is that your amplitude can also change due to a change in lithology or a change in porosity. And so a lot of times um, what's really common is that you can do rock physics modeling. So you can create these synthetic uh, seismic um, responses saying, okay, well, I think I have, you know, 90% uh, net to gross sand. What does it look like in seismic if it's 10% porosity versus 20% uh, porosity? And then, okay, well, what if we just put more shale in it or make it sandy or how similar do those look in, in seismic? And so it's a great way, rock physics modeling really allows you to do some hypothesis testing and kind of understand your risk and your uncertainty when working with seismic. Carbonates versus volcanoes, we've seen a couple examples of these. Um, so they can be kind of 
confused for each other, particularly if you're working in a frontier basin or an area that you're not familiar with. Um, and I've shown you a few cases where we actually have carbonates and volcanoes, <laughs> kind of the carbonates building on volcanoes, and we have them both in, in, in the same area. Um, and so one of the things you want to keep in mind is that sometimes you're actually able to see the internal structure between uh, these two, two cases. And so here's a case of a carbonate, and I pointed out in previous lectures, where you can actually see the internal architecture of the carbonate if your seismic is good quality enough. Um, you know, the volcanoes tend to build cone and cone, and sometimes you can actually get a little bit of hint of that also, um, if you're lucky. <laughs> And so I'm just going to wrap up with some of the, the pitfalls. Um, you know, it's just remembering that what we're seeing in seismic, like if you go back and you remember that what we're seeing in seismic is due to acoustic impedance differences and interfaces and not geology, um, you know, related to the geology, <laughs> that, that that really helps you kind of ground yourself and, and avoid a lot of these pitfalls is, um, you know, just thinking about it in terms of what can the seismic actually see and understanding all the, the different factors that affect acoustic impedance, um, you know, and, and changes in the reflection coefficient. Um, if you remember that, you can kind of handle a lot of the pitfalls, um, but other things to remember are acquisition, processing, phase, and polarity. And so, you know, being aware of your phase, your polarity, what happened during acquisition, um, what processing steps your seismic went through, all of those can, can really help you make sure to avoid pitfalls as much as possible. So as always, thanks for listening. <laughs>